The Messianic era, according to Jewish tradition, is a time when everyone in the world is perfected without faults, flaws, and even sin. Everyone in humanity speaking in the Hebrew language and the world acknowledging that the Jews have been right about God all along. And King Moshiach draws his kingdom according to Rambam and his commentary on the scripture of the Hebrew Bible. None of which can occur. This messianic era said to come. None of it can occur in the real world. It would take the power of God to completely change the natural order of the world and the natural order of humanity itself. <clears throat> with miracles and wonders, which is not supposed to happen in the Messianic era, according to Rambam, the great scholar of the Hebrew Bible and the Talmud of antiquity. Antiquity is from the beginning to 400 common era, and from 400 common era to 1600 is the Middle Ages, also known as the Dark Ages. And from 1600 to today, it's called the Common Era, and many ages occurred within that time. It begins with the Age of Enlightenment, reason, followed through with knowledge, uh, science, medicine, and today, information, which uh, began with the uh, advent of the computer in the late 1960s. And, of course, we have the Internet. And the dawning of the Internet was 1957, when the Russians sent up the first satellite called Sputnik. That was in 1957, the year I was born, as a matter of fact. But that was the dawning of the age of uh, satellites in space and then, of course, the Internet. God has never changed the beliefs and thoughts of any human being, Jews or Gentiles. And yet, in the time when of the Messianic era, everyone is supposed to exalt the Jewish people, speak Hebrew. Now that would be quite a feat for any man to even attempt. And God's never done that in the Hebrew Bible. He uses men to achieve his purpose. Men like Noah, build me an ark. I have a purpose, I need an ark. King David, King Solomon, build me a temple. The exiles of Assyria, Babylon, who returned by a declaration of Cyrus of Persia, who were forgiven of all sins. God says it was for, it's just for me. You've, you've continued to sin. You haven't offered sacrifices to me. But you know what he's really saying there? Contrary to what the Christians say, he's saying no matter what you do, you're mine. And I forgive all of your sins in your exile and remember them no more. And they're released to build Cyrus's declaration. He was appointed, this Gentile, Cyrus, of Persia who defeated Babylon and the Chaldeans who had defeated the Assyrians. Now they had taken it and defeated the northern kingdom. Babylon took Judah, the southern kingdom. They were all in Assyria. All thir Remnants of all 13 tribes returned according to the scripture. I do know that the Talmud has some 10 tribes lost. That just simply does not uh, uh, that's not what the scripture says. So, I don't know where the story comes from. I'm not a Talmud scholar. I, I'm a scholar of the prophets. And that's what this is about. It's not about the Torah, the first five books. It's about the prophets and the end times. Is there a Messianic age? 
Where is there a day of the Lord? Because the Messianic age does not include it. So, the Messianic era is based on verses in the Hebrew Bible that you can actually, if you take them to be prophecy, and they appear to be, then you come up with the Messianic age. But again, it can't happen. And that's not how God works. And he has a day of the Lord. A better interpretation is needed of the prophecies of the Messianic era with God's multiple purposes for having a verse written that appears to be prophecy but cannot occur without his changing the natural order of the world. What we do have as prophecy that can occur are the times to come of Jeremiah 31, verses 27 31 and 38. It's chapter 31. There's, there's three different. They, they, they all begin with those verses, but they're very large paragraphs with many other verses. The time to come is here. The land blooms again. Jerusalem has been rebuilt. And the new covenant between God and the Jewish people is here. Those verses, that's what they say. Verse 28 is basically... The Jews have returned. The land blooms again. God is watchful over them plants. And their cattle are, are uh, well fed and fat. <laughs> that is today. And it began in 1948. After the land had laid desolate for well over 2,000 years. After the Holocaust. The Jews returned. And quite simply... What God has said is, is not that everybody's got to be sin free for me to come back. Or the next mitzvah performed will bring God back. No. It's just come back. Because when he comes, he comes with a new covenant. A covenant of once again, I forgive your sins and remember them no more. Just as he did with the Syria Babylon exiles and their return for the second temple and what do we all know there's another temple to be built the time is here the, that that I, I consider that the verse jeremiah 31 28 the land blooms again the next verse that applies see a time is coming jerusalem shall be rebuilt as it is today see a time is coming i will make a new covenant with you not like the covenant I made with your fathers out of Egypt. Which is acknowledged in the Christian Bible. In the covenant, it reads, I make a new covenant with you. I shall write Torah on your hearts and everyone shall heed me. But that's not, that's not how to read it because he says, he says, because this is going to happen, Torah on your heart, which is a metaphor, of course. For I will forgive your sins and remember them no more. And we have a temple to be built. Surprise, surprise. You think he didn't know? Of course he knew. He knows all things from beginning to end. So it's a covenant of sin forgiveness. You come back. I'm going to come back. I'm going to... I'm not going to remember any of the sins you have done since you've been gone. And he says in the covenant of friendship that comes with Moshiach, which means the anointed one, the descendant of David of Isaiah 11, 1 and 2, who the sages believe is described in Isaiah 53, known as the leper scholar, He's got a temple to be rebuilt. And he provides for it in Malachi 3. That's where you go from there. See a time is coming. Well, it's here. 
Isaiah wrote for the Assyrian Babylon exiles. Jeremiah is writing for the Roman dispersal, the diaspora. And that means away from, from Israel, away from the promised land. And that's where the Jews were for the most part uh, until they returned in 48 and created Israel within the promised land. It doesn't, it's not all the promised land, but it, it, it's an incredible country. Incredible country. It's new. I mean, they have the whole city, of course, but it's uh, vibrant. They're, they're always in the top ten, just about everything you look for in the country. The question becomes, how do the, now that the time is here, the new covenant is here, how do the Jewish people, how are they informed of it? How do they find out? God has to use a man. Now, Moses relayed the first covenant to the Israelites, the Jewish people. And he says a prophet like Moses will come one day, come again. He says this in Deuteronomy. And he's never come. Moses is known for two things. The Exodus, leading the, Israel, the, the slave Israelites out of Egypt into the Promised Land. And Orthodox Judaism believes, and I agree 100%, that Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. That God dictated it to him verbatim. Which makes sense. How else is Moses going to know the story of Genesis? How, long before his time. How is he going to know the laws of Leviticus, the animal sacrificial worship and atonement laws? And in general, how the Jewish people had derived from the Torah 613 laws. Now, a lot of them had to do with the sacrificial system, which God did away with. He just said, I, I, know, I taught you what sin is. I taught you if you sin, it's going to cost you. I made you give up your animals. And I taught you how to cook your food. Cook your food. You know, that was still being disobeyed in the times of Solomon. He found some of his own soldiers out in the field after a battle, chopping up bulls and eating them all. And he, you know, in a fit, he ran out there and told him, I'm building a big altar at my camp tonight. Bring your bulls up there. So anyway, that whole system was done away with. There's only, okay, so we have Elijah's coming. We have the prophet like Moses' coming. We have the Moshe, descendant of David, coming. And we have one description of a righteous servant. And each of these men were righteous, and they were all servants of God. No man has ever come who fits all 12 verses of Isaiah 53. The one description we have. Not even Jesus Christ. He's not even close. He's not in a discussion in my opinion. And I'm going to show that partly in this video. But there will be many videos to follow. This site, this channel, is primarily for me to promote two books that I have written. One of them is called Isaiah 53 and the Day of the Lord which has a lot of this information, but oh, so much more. And the sequel to it, the second book, The Life of God's Righteous Servant. And I'm going to go ahead and uh, put the plug in for it, instead of at the end, I'm almost done. You can find these two books, they're unpublished. I'm having a difficult time getting them published because it just turns Judaism's Messianic era upside down. And um, these publishers, the Jewish publishers, primarily love to sell the Talmud and the Hebrew Scriptures, Shemash. Um, they, don't want, they don't want to offend the rabbis. And here's something you never hear. Here's something they never teach when they're yelling and praying for Moshiach to come. And make all these changes in the world. Have the Jews exalted by the world and everybody saying, Jews, you were right. And the world's at peace and in harmony. Nations, nations, friends with nations. 
here's what here's what those first those twelve verses boil down to. Here's who we're looking for. The man is despised. And and remember, the Christians say this is Jesus. The man is despised, shunned by men, a man of suffering, familiar with disease. <clears throat> and he's accounted, thought of, as plagued, smitten. As in a hard blow <clears throat> and afflicted by God. He is a man with persistent hardships and troubles, grievously affected, especially by disease, and severely injured at one time or another. A man of many bruises and scars, some books say stripes. The Christians are famous for saying, by his stripes we are healed, and they're referring to the whips uh, used in the scourge by Rome at, in the Passion of the Christ leading to the crucifixion. The man is a sinner. And though, as though God does not like him, he is disfigured at birth. This is not the perfect, unblemished Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. There's no crucifixion in Isaiah 53. There's no death. The man is exposed to death. Jesus wasn't exposed. He died. The man's given long life. Sees his children. Jesus didn't have children. And he makes the many righteous by his knowledge. By his knowledge. It's not by human sacrifice, it's not by blood. This is what God says with regards to the rabbis, who would be called shepherds in the Hebrew Bible. I'm going to deal with the shepherds. I will demand a reckoning of them from my flock, for my flock. And the flock would be the Jewish people. And I will dismiss them from tending the flock. Then I will appoint a single shepherd over them to tend them, my servant David. So this is when Moshe comes. He's here and God has a reckoning and dismisses the rabbis. It's not from their synagogues. It's not from their jobs. And this includes religious leaders and leaders in general. Dismissed in the eyes of God. They're no longer in right standing with God, which means they do not go into the scroll of remembrance of Malachi 3, which I'm getting to, which is entry to heaven for all those who live during the day of the Lord. It's a special heaven because it's a special time and everybody begins sin free. But they got to get back to sin. they got, they got to start. You don't want the evil inclination to get you after God cleans your slate and you want to show him the respect you have for his book and come back to or go to, if you've never been, back to Judaism, back to synagogue, Shabbat. But there's a, but there's a new covenant, you say. Yes, there is. It's only an amendment. The amendment is be mindful of the teachings I gave Moses at Oreb of my laws and commandments and rules for all of Israel. That's the change, mindful. And of course there's sin forgiveness in it and that wasn't in the first covenant. That's what it is. Because he keeps saying, and I will be your God and you will be my people. He says that about David too. My servant David, he shall tend them. He be, shall be a shepherd to them, not a king. God knew Israel would be a democratic country. I, the Lord, will be their God. My servant David shall be a ruler among them. And I will grant them a covenant of friendship. So when he comes, God grants his covenant. That covenant includes, and all this starts heading towards Malachi 3, where God says he's returning to his temple suddenly and that Elijah is to clear the way at, and be the messenger of this new covenant. I says, I will place my sanctuary among them. 
There's a lot more to this friendship coming, but this is the important part. My presence shall rest over them. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. It sounds like at some point he stopped being your God and you were his people. He just keeps repeating it. It's just, it's just a confirmation of the first covenant with the amendment, be mindful. What being mindful is, rather than some kind of strict compliance, I think in terms of ultra-Orthodox versus Reconstructionism, you got conservatism and orthodox kind of in the middle. It's for, you know, everybody to decide. Or the righteous servant will let you know someday. The Messianic era should really be called the times of the anointed one in the awesome, fearful day of the Lord. Because that's when God says he's going to return. And Elijah's purpose is the same as the righteous servant of Isaiah 53. He's, I'm not going to go into it all. Uh, this is just an abbreviated version of a video I am putting together. I'm still trying to get all my equipment together. That will also be called Messianic era versus the day of the Lord. There'll be a lot more to it. But they had the same purpose. We know that the prophet like Moses is necessary. It can be any one of them as, as long as he can deliver the message. And Elijah's the messengers. They all start falling together. And what it is is we have one description of one man. And he fulfills the final prophecy of God of four men to come. He has the capabilities and capacities of, of not only being the righteous servant who makes the many righteous, but everything Elijah would do, everything David would do, and everything the prophet like Moses would do. I mean, it's implied, it's implicit. I'm only describing one, and I'm sending four. Here he is. This is the man you look for, a man of suffering, familiar with disease. And God says in the verse of Jeremiah 38, where see a time is coming, Jerusalem shall be rebuilt, that ends with, and the Jewish people shall never be defeated and dispersed again. And Elaborating more on it again in another video, it all has to do with getting that third temple built because that's what he returns to. And he says, if Elijah's not successful, he's the one that clears the way, not David. When I do come, I'm coming with utter destruction. If he comes and the temple's not here, is what he says, his last words to the prophets in Malachi 3. I can tell you, my, my belief is he's not talking about doing it in his power. No, he's talking about his creation is going to do it. Presumably the Middle East, another great war like the Six-Day War. This time, if they attack and Israel takes that mound again, I would suggest blowing up that golden dome. They don't have any problem doing it. They didn't have any problem throwing the Jews out of their countries and taking all their goods and materials and homes. They didn't have any problem getting rid of all their synagogues and tearing them down. It is time for the enemy to leave. And if Jordan does it, I would propose that a treaty be made with them of surrender or utter destruction, that they grant every Palestinian citizenship. They won't do it. They want the enemy inside Israel. I don't think God wants that. Those two books can be found at Keith McCarty, McCarty dot wordpress dot com. The script of this video is on it. If you can't understand all my words, I'm from Texas. I have a southern accent. This would be the first thing you see, then you'll see the book, uh, The Life of the Righteous Servant, and then the, the first book written 
And that is Isaiah 53 in the day of the Lord. God said in a time to come, in Jeremiah 31, when the desolate land blooms again, many of the Jewish people have returned. And Jerusalem has been rebuilt. God will make a new covenant with the Jewish people. The land lay desolate from the time Rome destroyed the second temple and the Jewish people were dispersed uh, primarily throughout Europe but eventually the world. But after the Holocaust, 1948, they created the state of Israel, now considered a country. So this is, this is the day that the new covenant is here. But how does it get announced? Now, the first covenant between God and the Israelites was basically, if you do all of my commandments, all of my laws, abide by everything, that I tell to Moses and Moses gives to you, and you all agree to this, then I will be your God and you will be my people. Well, in this new covenant, he repeats that. It's really just an amendment, which can be found in the discussion of that can be found in these videos. But the most important part is, how are the Jewish people to recognize This new Moses, this, who, who's going to deliver it to him? It's here, it's supposed to be here, the new covenant is, is supposed to be in place, and it includes sin forgiveness. God forgives the sins of the Jewish people, just as he did the Assyrian Babylonian exiles, and as a holy seed, they built the second temple. Well, there's another temple to be built. And once again, God's forgiven the sins, and he says... This will cause Torah to be written on your heart, which is a metaphor for the people are going to come back to Judaism in droves and start studying and be more learned in the Torah. It's just a metaphor. And everyone shall heed him. Well, with the new covenant, there's only two that have not been delivered in the Hebrew Bible. It's the covenant of friendship. And this new covenant. Well, the covenant of friendship comes with Mashiach, the descendant of David. Or he's present, and when he is, God grants this new covenant. It is also said to be the start of the Messianic era. I have a video on that. Um, you should. <laughs> I, I think the day of the Lord is more important. And in the day of the Lord, which he announces prophetically in Malachi 3, in the very first verse, he says, I'm sending my messenger to clear the way before me, and I shall return to my temple suddenly. The angel of the covenant that you desire is already on the way. Because there's a lot to that. Why, why is this angel of the covenant already on the way? Clearly, that is the new covenant of Jeremiah. And we have a man who doesn't have identification. No, there's no description of him. Elijah is the messenger. But God has to have somebody, somebody like Moses. And he says, one day, I'm going to send a prophet like Moses. Again, no description. So we have four men coming, the Moshiach, the sending of David, no description, although the sages and rabbis of the Talmud believed he was described in Isaiah 53. They called him the leper scholar, just because of the verses. He's a man of suffering, familiar with disease, but he makes the many righteous by his knowledge. Christianity believes that describes Jesus Christ. And that's what you'll find 
in just about all these videos. God has passed his wrath to Christianity in Isaiah 51. He tells the Jews, I'm taking my cup of wrath, my bowl of reeling from you, and I'm passing it to those who told you to get down on the ground and walked all over you. That's Christianity. They took the book. They tell the Jews that they don't understand their own book, that it is prophetic of Jesus Christ in Isaiah 53, and that it describes Jesus Christ. And I disagree with that vehemently. But that is, that's the whole point of this day of the Lord. He's got to have a man. There's four men that he's sending. Elijah, sending a David that he calls David. Elijah, David, the prophet like Moses, and the righteous servant. Now he has a description. And all three of these other men were righteous, and they were servants of God. We have one description. It is implicit that God intended that man to have the attributes and capabilities of all four men. One description, four men. Isaiah 53 describes the man God is going to use in the day of the Lord. He wasn't supposed to come before that. Certainly doesn't fit the time of Jesus. See a time to come. The land has to have laid desolate for it to bloom again. The land wasn't desolate in the days of Jesus. God says, I'm returning to my temple. In the days of Jesus, God was in his temple. And the, and because the temple was there. None of it applies. So that's, that's what the Jewish people are looking for today. They're looking for the man of Isaiah 53. He's not the Jewish people, as Judaism teaches today, as one man Israel. He's certainly not Jesus Christ. He's just a man living at this time, in the time to come. The Jews, it, it's very simple. God says to his chosen, when you return, I will return. Because he knew what Rome was going to do. He knew they were going to be dispersed. It's called the Diaspora, away from Israel. And he knew they'd come back. I have written two books. The first book is Isaiah 53 and the Day of the Lord. It covers everything I'm talking about and much, much more. And there's a sequel to it. The life of the righteous servant of God of Isaiah 53. It's a chronicle of my life. That God, as he had Moses write the Torah, dictated to me. He's my ghostwriter of my autobiography, and it focuses in primarily on everything that happened to my life that has me fit every verse of Isaiah 53. He came to me, basically as Jeremiah would say, in the womb. But instead of making me a godly man, he made sure I fit these verses. A man of suffering, a man of sorrow, a sinner. As an atheist for 50 years, he made sure I didn't associate with anybody with anybody that was religious. I've never had any training. All of my knowledge comes from him. And when you read these books and you take all that into consideration, you'll know what the Orthodox Jews know. There's no way Moses wrote those books, the first five, the Torah, on his own. And there is absolutely no way I wrote these two books on my own. It's just not possible. I have far too much knowledge. I have knowledge that the great Jewish sages and rabbis, their intellectual commentary uh, people, don't even have a clue about. They, they have no clue what a man in divine beings is, for instance. That the Holy Spirit is a person, for instance. What a Lord, 
what were the host of the Lord's host is, for instance, God's way of communicating with the world. And a lot of that is because he wanted it that way. He knew what they were going to come up with. He knew what Judaism would be in the day of the Lord. He put a lot of these things like the angel of his presence and the Holy Spirit in Ezekiel. I mean, Isaiah 63, he didn't, he didn't put it in the Torah where he knew they'd get old of it. Uh, a host of the Lord's host. You find that in Joshua, you know, the sixth book. It's not Torah. And, um, of course, Jacob did wrestle with a, an angel. I mean, that's what they say. But that's not what Jacob says, whose name was changed to Israel. That's not what Jacob says. He says, I wrestle with a man in divine beings. Any man that the Spirit of God alights upon, such as the descendant of David, in Isaiah chapter 11, is going to be a man in divine beings because God is in his spirit. And there's videos on that already. This is only the fourth. I've got three videos out. I'm getting ready to uh, upload another one. But it's, it's all in the books. Every question you have, and every time you read it, understand, I've never had any training. I've never associated with religious people. Uh, it's just never been a part of my life until I was 50 years old. But here is here's the last thing I'm going to say on it. You can find the books at keithmccartymccarty.wordpress.com. This is the last thing I'm going to say on it. Isaiah 53 has got one verse that nobody can match. Nobody can fit except the man himself. God chooses to crush him with disease. So that he will offer himself for guilt. And he might be given long life. And see his children. And by his knowledge he makes the many who become a multitude righteous by his knowledge. How do you know if a man's offered himself for guilt? Well, how about a man who's crushed with disease and receives long life? I had colon cancer quite a while back. It was very severe. I should have died from it. But they were able to extract it, a dangerous surgery, because I had been shot through the abdomen when I was 18, and I had been opened up from stem to stone. And they had to go back and do it again to get this uh, incredibly large tumor that had burst through my colon. I was bleeding internally. I mean, I couldn't even get up to go see a doctor anymore. I was dying in an apartment. But the planes hit New York. That's how long ago I'm talking about. And it just inspired me to try one more thing. I got a colonoscopy and they found the tumor. I had been trying to find out why I couldn't eat, why I had such a severe pain in my belly for months after month, and I was just wasting away. But they got it, and I took the chemo for it, and colon cancer has never come back. But when I finished the uh, chemo, they ran more tests. I came back in to see him, and they're shaking their heads, bad news. I said, what now? They said, your lungs. And they showed me the pictures. They said, you see those white spots? That's cancer. That's cancer we can't treat. It's so advanced. I said, well, what does that mean? You're not going to treat it. They said, you're going to die, and you're going to die real soon. Now, if you study lung cancer and you see a stage 4 lung cancer, you're going to find out that people don't live more than a year. With good treatment, maybe five. That's the way, that's what I read on the internet. And I've never seen a doctor again. From that day, when they told me that, that was it. It crushed me. I stopped working. Uh, I was just walking around in that daze every day, waiting to die. But, uh, that was 20 years ago. God crushed me with disease, and he has since told me I did it. And he said, you know when it started? I said, that around when I got shot. He said, yeah. He said, I had everything in the world to do with that. And in my power, I gave you that cancer. And in my power, I prevented you from dying. You no longer have it. 
I removed it from your lungs. That's why you never have any symptoms. That's why you've been a triathlete running half Ironmans, going eight straight hours, training every day with nary a problem because I did it. And then he had to teach me the scripture. I had never read the Bible. He said, uh, let's go to the bookstore. His spirit had entered into me as a, as a baby just to monitor my life. And he's in his spirit. Again, I've already discussed that in other videos. And the book is more detailed. And so, a man of divine things just... <laughs> There's three persons in this body. The person of God, the person of the Holy Spirit, who is the angel of the presence, who is the angel who brings the covenant. And I am to a massive and quite, and I do in those books. When they're published, that's the formal announcement, whether anybody wants to read it or not. The announcement that the new covenant is here, the covenant of friendship is here. So these videos and those books, which I could not have written, are my proofs, and I promise you, they are so far greater than the proofs God gave Moses to convince 600,000 Israeli men, slaves, and their families to follow him out of Egypt. I'm not talking about all the miracles. I'm talking about what he had to approach them with. He said to God, who am I that they would listen to me? And then you can find this in the Torah. I guess it's in Genesis or Exodus. Um, that's what all this is about. God said he was going to do this. He's doing it. The Jewish people have a different idea of what happens when the descendant of David comes. I've explained why it's wrong. I've explained that things that cannot happen, prophecies that cannot happen in the real world, you have to come up with another answer. God had multiple purposes. He wrote some of those verses they rely on just for the people of antiquity. They were illiterate. It was a society of ignorance. They're like children. They like to be told stories. They like to feel good too. They wanted to hear that people were going to live to be over 100 years old. A man of 100 years would be thought of but as a child. Phrases like that the Jewish people today take, take to heart and say, well, that's going to happen. These bodies don't last a thousand, a hundred years, which would mean if you're a child, 10,000 years. They, you know, we're supposed to know. We went, we went into the age of enlightenment. Science, medicine, knowledge, and today the internet. You can learn anything you want to learn. They're still praying for the resurrection of the dead, the Orthodox Jews, because it's the 13th fundamental uh, principle of the fundamentalist uh, of Judaism. Do they have any idea? You had a million people basically leave in the Exodus. You had six million in the Holocaust alone. There's, that's, that's 7 million. That's how many Jewish Israelis there are today. And that, and what about from the time the first group got to Egypt, they were there 400 years, everybody that died. Those that came back, those in the promise, those in the northern kingdom, the southern kingdom, what are you going to do with those people? What's the government of Israel going to do? Can you even fit them into Israel? There's so many millions of people you're talking about. No, they, they had no food, no money, no clothes, no shelter. <laughs> they can't read. You've got some savage people in there that still will be eating meat raw. They see a dead squirrel in the street, they're going to go pick it up and nibble on it. <laughs> it's that bad. It's an impossibility. And yet, and then they ask themselves, how come nobody's coming to our How come the young people aren't coming to our synagogues? I've, I've got news for you. They're very real. This generation is very real. They came up on the internet. They can't. They they have learned about um, fake news and people trying to trick you and people telling you things are going to happen that don't happen. 
or something did happen and it did happen. On and on and on. You, I have three children. They're in the 30s. They're all married. I've got a couple grandchildren. But it's, my, it's part of my job is to draw them to Judaism. And God gave me a hand. He said, here's the amendment. Tell them to be mindful of my teachings to Moses, that horrible of my <coughs> commandments and laws and rules. Be mindful. And that's for everybody to take it to heart as they want to. With how they believe and practice an orthodox, mindful might be something entirely different from a conservative or for an orthodox. It's for each individual, but practice Judaism. You know, the basics. Celebrate Shabbat. Don't work on Saturday. Go to the ha holidays, particularly even though everybody is sin-free. You don't want the inclin evil inclination to get you. You've got a clean slate. Respect God for forgiving your sins. Now, he wants you to be a holy city to build the third temple, like the exiles built the second one. But once you hear this message, you're on your own to keep your slate clean. And that would mean go to Yom Kippur and keep your slate clean. Do as many mitzvahs as you can handle every day. That's my job. That's my task. And if I fail, if I can't get the people to recognize me in my capacity as Elijah, the righteous servant of God, he says when he comes, and basically he's saying, if that temple's not there for me, or it's not going to be built, and of course he would know. I'm coming with utter destruction to the land. And what he's saying is, build the temple, and you will never be defeated and dispersed again. Don't build it, and your enemies in the Middle East are going to destroy that land. He's not going to do it in his power. It's kind of like saying, I'm going to raise up armies against you. Well, those armies were already there and already raised. He just... Took credit for it. Told the Jews, I'm going to raise up armies. But he knew they're already there and they're coming after you. <laughs> he already knew. But he wanted you to fear him, and that's why he did it. And in a sense, it's his creation. He says, I am my creation. Uh, it, it is, in a sense, him doing it. You know, he's not lying. I guess is what we're get, I'm getting at, what we're getting at. So enjoy the videos, read the books, they're free right now, when they're published, buy a copy for your coffee table. Thank you. The commentary of Rashi and myself on Isaiah 52, verses 13 through 15, and all of Isaiah 53, describing God's righteous servant, the Moshiach. According to my commentary, which includes commentary on the commentary of Rashi. Rashi's commentary is that the man being described is Israel, which means it's not the Moshiach of chapter 11. And which also means we have no description of him. 52.13 Behold, my servant shall prosper. He shall be exalted and lifted up. And he shall be very high. Rashi. This is Midrash form. He takes parts of verses and comments on the parts. And he'll, he doesn't necessarily take all the verse, but the parts he wants to comment on. And this is how he starts. Behold, my servant shall prosper. Behold, this is Rashi now. Behold, at the end of days, my servant Jacob i.e. the righteous among him shall prosper. Keith. And I'm using the JPS. Uh, this is from Shabbat.org. They had the rendition that doesn't include the quotes between 13 and 15 and the quotes between verse 1 and 6 of uh, 53. The multiple quote verses. But this is from the JPS. Indeed, my servant shall prosper, be exalted, and raised to great heights. My commentary on that is, 
My servant is now the Gentile, and not the exiles, who becomes my righteous servant. In Isaiah 53, 11, after passing the test of devotion in Isaiah 53, 10. When he makes himself an offering for guilt in the covenant with God. From a sinful man whose life had been lowly, full of grievous events and serious injuries, a man of pain and suffering, familiar with disease, that the Spirit of God alights upon him to the crown of God's righteous servant who rises to great heights. This is uh, Isaiah chapter 11, verse 10. Chapter 11 begins with, the Spirit of God alights upon the twig of the shoot that grows from the stump of Jesse, where the ancestral tree of the kings of Judah has been cut down. That would be the line of Jesus in the book of Matthew. It's the first thing you read in the New Testament. He can't be the man of chapter 11. That's not just because that line was banished with Chaconia when Babylonia took over, uh, defeated the Jews and destroyed the second temple, but because he doesn't come from the stump. That's why it's written that way. The stock of Jesse that has remained standing shall become a standard to peoples. Nations shall seek his counsel, and his abode shall be honored. Again, Isaiah 11.10. The abode of the righteous servant is humble when the Lord cuts him off from the land of the living, the world of material things in society. In Isaiah 53, verse 8. And in the end, the abode of the servant is one to be honored. In Isaiah chapter 11, verse 10. From a poor man to a rich man, with the many as his portion, and the multitude as his spoil, prosperous and held in high regard by many and a multitude of the Jewish people. Verse 14. As many wondered about you, how marred his appearance is from that of a man, and his features from that of people. Rashi. That's, that's again from Shabbat.org and, and the commentary comes from, from them too. They have the commentary of Rashi on that. As many wondered, his answer, commentary, as many peoples wondered about them when they saw them in their humble state and said to one another, how more is his Israel's it's in brackets, appearance from that of a man. See how their features are darker than those of other people? So, as we see with our eyes. This is Keith, verse 14. Just as the many were appalled at him, so more was his appearance, unlike that of man, his form beyond human semblance. Commentary, so marred was his appearance unlike that of man. Based on Isaiah 53, verse 10, and its primary purpose, this is the beginning of identifying the righteous servant as a man with disfigurement, blemished, with disease. He is not a man without defect, such as lambs, or sin offerings, and rams, or guilt offerings. In the Torah, that would be Leviticus. If I were to be seen with all of my injuries from accidents and surgical operations at one time before healing, together with my con congenital disfigurement, my right shoulder and arm is withered, my appearance and features would be marred from the bed of a man and people, unlike that of normal men. And that's important because. If you can find a way to describe, to describe uh, this man as so marred and his parents, I mean, 
Sounds like somebody you never want to look upon. But in this verse, verse 15, it is said, So shall he cast down many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For what had not been told them they saw. And what they had not heard they gazed. Rashi. What had not been told them. His answer, commentary. Concerning any man they saw in him. They gazed. So shall he cast down many nations. Uh, he just puts a Hebrew word in here. I, I don't know. They gazed. It says Hebrew, Hebrew letters. And then again he says they gazed. So shall he cast down many nations. Rashi. So now even he, his hand, will become powerful. And he will cast down the horns of the nations who scattered him. That would be the Jewish people scaring the nations. Becoming powerful. Shall shut. They shall shut their mouths at a great bewilderment. For, he says, honor. They're going to shut their mouths. All this, uh, see what they had never uh, been told and hear what they had never heard. Or honor. Keep. Just so he shall startle many nations, kings shall be silenced because of him, for they shall see what has not been told them, shall behold what they never have heard. My answer to that, nations, the Gentiles, startled, and kings, leaders of nations, Silence. By seeing God's righteous servant, God's servant David, Elijah, and the prophet like Moses as one man. And hearing that God's righteous servant arrives in the time to come of Jeremiah 31 and the day of the Lord. That God's righteous servant is the only man to come who is described in the scripture and is inherently and implicitly the anointed one David. Elijah, the prophet like Moses, of whom there is no description for identification, that the Jewish people throughout the world will be forgiven by God of all their inequities and sins by God's written word in the day of the Lord. That would be the new part of the new covenant, the new inclusion from Jeremiah 31. That heaven is being created for only the Jewish people. Christians will be surprised at that, as will Muslims. That God's righteous servant of Isaiah 53 is a Gentile, according to the scripture. That Jesus, being a Jew, cannot be God's righteous servant. That God's righteous servant is familiar with disease and crushed with disease, blemished, and could never be an offer for sacrifice. No man of Isaiah 53 can fit an offer of sacrifice. That's why God blemishes him. That's why God chooses to crush him with disease. To make sure that just doesn't happen. Because he knew what the Gentiles were going to do with Leviticus. That the host of the Lord's host is a man and divine beings. That the captain of the Lord's host is a Gentile host of the Lord's host and a harbinger of God's righteous servant. That God's righteous servant becomes a man in divine beings when God's spirit, who is the angel of his presence, and he is a person, the angel of the Lord, the Holy Spirit alights upon him in Isaiah chapter 11 verses 1 through 2. That God would really redeem the Jewish people and in the same manner that he did in the Hebrew Bible with one man. At the time to come of Jeremiah 31 began when the state of Israel was created in 1948. That God's righteous servant fulfills and completes the remaining six or so prophecies of God in the day of the Lord. Okay.
This is uh, Isaiah 53, verse 1, begins with quotes, and the quotes end after verse 6. The first speakers of Isaiah 53 are the witnesses of the righteous servant, in the quoted multiple verses 1 through 6, the many who are made righteous by God's righteous servant. That's what the story is about. Verse 1, who would have believed our report, and to whom was the arm of the Lord revealed? Rashi. Who would have believed our report? Rashi. Commentary. So will the nations say to one another, were we to hear from others what we see, it would be unbelievable. I'm not certain what they see, but I think it's the Messianic era. Which is never going to occur. So I don't know how you can base your opinions, and I know Jews for Judaism for sure doesn't. Not so much Toby is saying of outreach Judaism. If you're going to base a description on a man you're trying to find on an event that has not occurred, whether it will or will not, what about the man who's being described if that is the case? What have you done? What if you don't recognize him? Utter destruction comes to the land of Israel. And right now, that would be the destruction of 7 million Israeli Jews. If you have been told by a prophet, both of you two, Jews for Jews, outright Jews, if, if your organizations have been told by a prophet, that God said he was going to raise up on us if we didn't do this and we didn't do that, and we know what happened. Syria defeated the port of the North Kingdom, South Kingdom, Judah. The Babylonians defeated and deported, and then Rome destroyed and defeated all of them and dispersed the Jews throughout the world. Because why? Because the prophet wouldn't listen to. The arm of the Lord is still rushing. Like this, with greatness and glory, to whom was it revealed until now? It's not a lot of explanation there, I'm not sure. Keith, who can believe what we have heard? Upon whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? My commentary. The witnesses ask, who can believe that God redeems the Jewish people by the new covenant with sin forgiveness? that is delivered by the messenger Elijah, who receives it from the angel of the covenant, Elijah being a man of heaven, of course, who is the angel of his presence, the Holy Spirit, that alights upon the anointed one. In Isaiah chapter 11, 1 through 2, by the covenant of friendship that comes with his servant David, when he, and that's God, sanctifies Israel by having the third temple built on his holy Mount Zion in Jerusalem. i got to see, I lost track here a little bit. Oh, who can believe what we have heard? Okay, that's what all these buys. By speaking to his prophet. Again, as he spoke to Moses face to face and friend to friend, and all by and with one man the Lord calls my righteous servant. Chapter 12 of the laws concerning King Moshiach of Ramah, that Moshiach will compel all of Israel to walk in the way of the Torah, perfect the entire world, motivating all the nations to serve God together. There will be neither famine nor war, neither envy nor competition. The entire world will be solely to know God. And the Jews will, therefore, be great sages and know the hidden matters with an understanding of their Creator to the full extent of human potential. Yet God simply says, and this comes through the two covenants of friendship, in the sentence uh, in Jeremiah 31, see a time is coming, Jerusalem is rebuilt. At the end of that, it says, they shall never be defeated and dispersed again. Here's what those say for the day of the Lord, the era of the Moshiach, or 
the times of the anointed one in an awesome, fearful day of the Lord. Yet God simply says he will send down the rain in its season. The trees of the field shall yield their fruit and the land shall yield its produce. The Jewish people shall continue secure on their own soil, never be overthrown and uprooted again. They shall no longer be a spoil for the nations. He will establish for them a planting of renown. And again, these kind of go in hand with see that the time is coming, the desolate land will bloom again, as I paraphrase it, of Jeremiah 31. They shall no more be carried off by famine. They shall have to bear again. They shall not have to bear again the taunts of the nations. He will establish them and multiply them. He will place his sanctuary among them forever. His presence shall rest over them. And when his sanctuary abides among them forever, the nations will know that the Lord sanctifies Israel. Who would believe that one man fulfills and completes the remaining prophecies of God in the day of the Lord? The remaining prophecy to be fulfilled is the delivery of two specific covenants and the arrival of God's righteous servant, who makes the many righteous, the anointed one, a shepherd, God calls my servant David, Elijah, who was taken to heaven and returns, and recounsels the members of the Jewish families one to the other through Judaism, Judaism, and righteousness, and the prophet like Moses, who wrote the Torah at the command and direction of God, the witness Israel poor, and who would believe them, that they had not been told by their wise men, sages, rabbis, theologians, that God's righteous servant of Isaiah 53 is a Gentile in the beginning. Isaiah 63 says God comes from a dawn that is interpreted in Judaism to be Christianity. It means he is coming from a Christian country. In addition, a dawn, uh, which is long since gone, is in the country of Jordan, east of the river Jordan. It's Gentile lands. He's coming from Gentile lands. And there are the people, the Jewish people, none are with him. He comes with a Gentile. Remember the captain of the Lord's host. Joshua asked him, are you an Israelite or one of us? He says, no. I'm the captain of the Lord's host. Now I've come. And then we never see him again. It's just three short verses. What are they about? They're about a man and divine beings being a host of the Lord's host. He comes with a Gentile. Well, Jesus was a Jewish man who came from Nazareth. Can you see God working in this? <laughs> the Jewish people. Isaiah 53 can't be him. He's a Jew. And God comes to the Gentile. It's not like, I mean, Cyrus of Persia was a Gentile. Elijah's a Gentile. He, he's, he's, he, he's a Tishbite. You can't find a clan of Tishbites in any of the tribes according to the genealogies provided. And he is an inhabitant. He's not from, he lives in Ramoth Gilead. Just to give you a frame of reference, he may as well have lived in Adam. It's a, it's a territory east of the River Jordan, north of Adam, and it's Arabs and Assyrians. And he lives there. The Jewish people did not come from Adam. They began the Promised Land. Returned from Egypt in the Exodus and were not allowed to pass through Adam. Huh. And returned from Europe after the Holocaust. Well, how's God coming anywhere if he doesn't have a man with him? How, how do we know anything about him if a man doesn't speak the words God tells him to speak? Did you think it was going to be a day of the Lord and he wasn't going to have a Moses? He's got a new covenant to deliver. It has to do with the first covenant. Well, who delivered it? Moses. It can't be the Jewish people. Okay, he's got to have a guy. One man. And he's got him described. He's a servant and he's righteous. So was King David. So was Elijah. And so was Moses. All servants, 
all righteous, one term, God's righteous servant. And I'm to believe from Rashi, Jews for Judaism, Outreach Judaism, that today the Jews are the righteous servant. Good luck convincing me. The witness report that they had never heard that the captain of the Lord's host is a Gentile and the harbinger of God's righteous servant who becomes the host of the Lord's host. It's, it's easy to understand. A man of divine beings is not an angel. A man of divine beings is a man that the spirit alights upon and like Ezekiel enters, God is in his spirit and then he speaks. We get that from Ezekiel. Chapter 11, Isaiah. The Spirit of God lights upon him. God is in his spirit. He is now a man of divine beings. Any prophet that said God says in his books was a man of divine beings. You know, it's a task. It can be one task. It can be many tasks. One man just had to wrestle with Jacob. And God spoke. The divine beings, I know Judaism doesn't recognize the Holy Spirit for some unknown reason as a person. I don't know what could be more clear. There's just too many scriptural references. But that's a man of divine beings. Spirit lines on. God's right there too. It's a man of divine beings, not an angel. The witness had never heard that the divine beings are the Holy Spirit who is the angel of his presence of Isaiah 63. An angel whose angelic body is not the form of a human with wings, but the very Spirit of God and God. The very angel who went before the Israelites in the Exodus and God was in him. Quote, this is God. I'm sending an angel before you to guard you on the way and to bring you to the place that I have made ready. Pay heed to him and obey him. Do not defy him. For he will not pardon your offenses since my name, that's Hashem, since Hashem is in him. But if you obey him and do all that I say, that would be God, not me, I will be an enemy to your enemies and a foe to your foes. That's Exodus chapter 23, verses 20 through 22. The witnesses have never heard that God created his spirit, is in his spirit, and his spirit is the body of the angel of his presence and the angel of the Lord. How the angel of the Lord is in the burning bush and God speaks to Moses. How a man divine beings wrestled with Jacob and God spoke to Jacob, renaming him Israel. How the ground was holy where Joshua fell to the ground before a Gentile with drawn sword and asked, What does my Lord command his servant? Captain of the Lord's host, answered Joshua, Remove your sandals from your feet, for the place where you stand is holy. And Joshua did so. It's Joshua chapter 5, 14 through 15. Those are the very words God spoke to Moses at the burning bush. The Lord is with the captain, and where the Lord is, so is the angel of his presence, the Holy Spirit, a man in divine things. How Elijah the Tishbite, an inhabitant of Ramoth Gilead, an Arab Assyrian town and land east of the river Jordan, is also a Gentile, host of the Lord's host. Okay, this one's a little involved and I'm really trying to press through. So I'll, I'll just uh, refer you to the book where this comes from. It's called Isaiah 53, the day of the Lord. It's about 280 some odd pages. It has a long, almost 35 page summary of one paragraph of each chapter, which is uh, really helpful. But it's, it's a lot more than just Isaiah 53. <clears throat> and God dictated it to me as he dictated the Torah to Moses. Verse 1. How Ezekiel is the host of the Lord's host, a man in divine beings. This is uh, Ezekiel, it's in quotes. I'll give you the chapter and verse in a second. And he said to me, O mortal, stand on your feet that I may speak to you. 
As he spoke to me, the Spirit entered into me and set me upon my feet, and I heard what was being spoken to me. See, God, they show God saying those words, but see, you can't hear them until the Spirit is in him. And God is in his Spirit. He tells us, the angel, obey him, because my name, I am in him. This is God speaking to Ezekiel, but Ezekiel does not hear God speak until at the same moment the Spirit enters him and sits him upon his feet. A Spirit of God entering a man and God speaking means the angel of God's presence, who is Spirit, alighted upon him and that God is in him. They could not believe. How the Lord is symbolized in the story where he appeared and spoke to Abraham by the terebinths of Mamre as three men standing near him. The three men represent a host of the Lord's host. It's a man with divine beings. It's three persons. In my case, it's the person of Keith McCarty. It's the person of God. And it's the person of the Holy Spirit. All right here. And it's not new. This is all throughout the biblical, the, the Hebrew Bible. It just wasn't revealed to you. That's why nobody can believe it. When they... The Leper Scholar. Rabbi Slomo Yishkaki, generally known today by the anchor name Rashi, which is Rabbi Shlomo Ishkaki, or A-S-H-I, was a medieval French rabbi and author of a comprehensive commentary on the Talmud and commentary on the Tanakh. He is known as the first rabbi to believe that the Jewish people as one man, Israel, are God's righteous servant of Isaiah 53. The early sages expected a personal Messiah to fulfill the Isaiah prophecy. No alternative interpretation was applied to this passage until the Middle Ages. This began in 400 Common Era. Rashi held the position that the servant passages of Isaiah referred to the collective fate of the nation of Israel the Jewish people, rather than a personal Messiah. Some, righteous, uh, some rabbis, such as Ibn Ezra and Kimshi, agreed. However, many other rabbinic sages during this same period of time and later, including Moses ben Maimon, commonly known as Maimonides, and often referred to by the acronym Rambam, a medieval Sephardic Jewish philosopher who became one of the most prolific and influential Torah scholars of the Middle Ages, realized the inconsistencies of Rashi's views and would not abandon the original Messianic interpretation. Rashi's commentary on Isaiah 52 verses 13 through 15 and 53, supporting his position conflicts with his commentary on the book of Zechariah, chapter 1, when he says, quote, and this is his, uh, a preamble to chapter 1. This is a commentary on a particular verse. The prophecy of Zechariah is extremely enigmatic because it contains visions resembling a dream that requires an interpretation. We cannot ascertain the truth of its interpretation until the teacher of righteousness comes. Nonetheless, I will put my heart to reconciling the verses one by one according to the interpretations that resemble it in following the interpretation of Jonathan. The teacher of righteousness Rashi awaits is God's righteous servant of Isaiah 53. 
That's how he's referred to. The teacher of righteous, the suffering servant, and on and on. It's good. There's a lot of different names, but there's no question the teacher of righteousness is God's righteous servant who makes the many righteous by his knowledge. He is referring to a particular man and not the people of Israel, which would include himself. Rashi is known for his inconsistencies in his, in his interpretations I have read. I don't know that to be true. I haven't studied Rashi. Some of the first written interpretations are targums, which are ancient paraphrases on biblical texts. See Isaiah 53 is referring to an individual servant, the Messiah, who would suffer. Messianic Jewish Talmudist Hrachmiel Fridland recounts these early views. Our ancient commentators with one accord noted that the context clearly speaks of God's anointed one. That would be from Isaiah chapter 11, the descendant of King David, the Messiah. The er Aramaic translation of this tractor ascribed to Rabbi Jonathan ben Azil, a disciple of Hillel, who lived early in the second century, common era, begins with the simple and worthy words, Behold, my servant Messiah shall prosper. He shall be high and increase and be exceedingly strong. As the house of Israel looked to him through many days, because their confidence was darkened among the peoples, and their complexion beyond the sons of men. Targum Jonathan on Isaiah 53 ad locum. That's in parentheses, and that ends the quotes. We find the same interpretation in the Babylonian Talmud. What is his, the Messiah's, name? The rabbis said his name is the Leper Scholar, as it is written. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him a leper, smitten of God and afflicted. That, of course, is from Isaiah 53. And that quote is from uh, Sanhedrin 98, small case B. Similarly, in an explanation of Ruth, chapter 2, verse 14, in the Midrash, Rabbah, it states, He is speaking of the King Messiah. Come hither, draw near to the throne, and dip thy morsel in the vinegar. This refers to the chastisements, as it is said, that he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. Again, from Isaiah 53, the Zohar, in its interpretation of Isaiah 53, points to the Messiah as well. There is, in the Garden of Eden, a palace named the Palace of the Sons of Sickness. This palace, the Messiah enters, and he summons every pain and every chastisement of Israel. All of these come and rest upon him. And had he not thus lightened them upon himself, there had been no man able to bear Israel's chastisements for the transgression of the law. As it is written, surely our sicknesses he has carried. That's from Zohar, Roman 2, 212, small case A. Rabbis today who believe Isaiah 53 describes the Jewish people have been left to their own analysis for this interpretation. It's not in the Talmud. And there are different opinions on how the Jewish people fulfill the verses of Isaiah 53. Rabbi Tovia Singer of Outreach Judaism and Jews for Judaism both believe Isaiah 53 describes the Jewish people as Israel. And they disagree with each other in their analysis. This is not unusual. Rabbi Nachmanides 
often disagree with Rabbi Menemines. Rambam. Toby the thing, singer follows the Christian belief that God sacrifices his children by applying the animal atonement and worship laws of the Torah, Leviticus, to human beings. And Jews for Judaism believes in an exaltation, the Messianic era, so to speak, of the Jewish people following the teachings of the sages and rabbis on an era of redemption, restoration, and exaltation of the Jewish people. The opinions and disagreements on the interpretation of Isaiah 53 are not a case of interpreting a vague law of God given to Moses, whose meaning must be determined in the oral tradition to be properly observed, those who believe Israel is described and is God's righteous servant do not understand the importance of having a description of a man prophesied to come. These men, this man does not work miracles. There has to be a description of it for the day of the Lord. God, God is coming with a new covenant. So there's an angel being sent with it too. And so is his messenger to clear the way for him. Okay, and to do other things, which is Elijah. A man who can do the things Elijah could do and had the knowledge Elijah would have. He is not the Elijah of the, of the biblical Bible. He was not taken to heaven alive. If you leave this earth and go and are pulled up to the platform of heaven, your body has died. That's why they looked for it for three days, couldn't find it. But nobody, he's gone, he's dead. The shortest verse in the Christian New Testament is, Jesus wept. That's it. <laughs> There's one verse, Jesus wept. He had just raised Lazarus from the dead, and still the people did not believe he was who he said he was. There is no description of him. There's none of Jesus. He didn't have a description, so he stole one. He said, I'm the man described in Isaiah 53. That's not even, that's not possible. He's not a man of suffering, familiar with disease. God didn't choose to crush him with disease that he would offer himself for guilt. He did not make the many righteous with long life and by his knowledge. He didn't have children. He wasn't exposed to death, he died. He wasn't shunned and despised. He wasn't accounted plague, smitten of God and afflicted. He didn't match any of the verses except one. He lied. He is a sinner. You can call him the unblemished lamb of God, but being called and said to be sinless is not the same as being sinless when the scripture reveals otherwise. And Judaism does not seem to realize how important a description is. Jesus did. He knew he didn't match. If he's as smart as everybody says he was, if he's teaching at synagogue when he's 12 years old, if he's the son of God, he knows. He knows he's not the man of Isaiah 53. Or at least if he's not that smart, he did find out on the cross he was wrong. Because he thought he was going to be given long life. He thought he was going to be exposed to death. Because he believed he was that man. And so what does he say on the cross when he sees he's going to die? Father, 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 why have you forsaken me? That's Jesus saying I'm not the man of Isaiah 53. So... Jews for Judaism and Outreach Judaism, they don't realize how important the description of God's servant David is for the building of the third temple. Not, not to mention avoidance of utter destruction to the land of Israel and the seven million Israeli Jews that live there. Of course, I know y'all don't live there or you didn't in past years for quite a while. Rambam says that King Moshiach 
builds the third temple, we will know he is Moshiach. People better know who he is long before that. It is. If Elijah is not recognized, his purpose in clearing the way for the Lord, Lord's return to his temple will not prosper. And God will bring utter destruction to the land. Now, it's possible you might be able to interpret that the land to be the world, but I'm pretty sure it's, he's just talking to Israel. There are about seven, okay, I just covered that. There are many unknowns in the teachings of the sages and rabbis of the ancient age, and God's righteous servant makes the many righteous by his knowledge and long life. Their teaching was, he's the leper scholar, a single man, a Messiah, which means anointed one, which comes from, which comes from uh, chapter 11 of Isaiah. There is only a description of this one man to come, and no man to this day has ever fulfilled all the verses of Isaiah 53. Not the man called the teacher of righteousness of the Dead Sea Scrolls, who founded the sect of Judaism called Essenes, 100 years before the birth of Jesus. Not Jesus, who claimed he was the man of Isaiah 53. And not any of the men who had been thought to be Hamashiach, the anointed one, from the Jewish revolt against Rome, such as Bar Kokhba, to Rabbi Menachem Mendel Shishin, known as the Lubavitcher, who died in 1994. But let's look at, there are references in Isaiah 53, I think it's verse 2, of a trunk that has grown out of arid uh, ground and uh, a reference to the righteous servant being uh, raised, raised to great heights like a, uh, a, a crown of a great tree. But that starts in chapter 11. Chapter 11, verse 1. The Spirit of God alights upon the twig of the shoot that grows from the stump of Jesse. It's a stump because the ancestral tree of Jesse, who is the father of King David, has been cut down. God banished the line of the kings of Judah when Babylon destroyed the temple and deported them to uh, Babylon. The last king, Jeconia, he just told him, no, no, no descendant of yours will ever rule on the throne of David, <clears throat> from the throne of David over Judah again. And that's what the stump is. A sheep grows out of it. That's, that's a different line of descendants. We don't know anything about it. David had many, many children. And from that particular branch or shoot, you find a twig on a tree, a new ancestral tree that nobody has any idea of. No man can prove who he is by saying, here's my ancestry back to King David. And the proof of it is not there. I mean, that's just common sense. you got to have a description of it. And then God continues using ancestral tree uh, metaphors in Isaiah 53. This is prophetic. Isaiah prophetically refers to the stump of Jesse, father of King David, as an announcement of the ending of the line of the kings of Judah. Now he's right, Isaiah's writing this. God's having him write it. 
But he's writing this long before Jeconia was banished by God and Jerusalem and the temple destroyed. Whose last king, Jeconia, was banished and the line terminated. The line of the kings of Judah, the ancestral tree of David, forbidden, forbidden to ever rule in Judah and Jerusalem. The tree fell, leaving a stump. It is the line of heirs in the first chapter of the book of the New Testament of Christianity of the Holy Bible. We start out with the banished ancestral tree in the Christian Holy uh, New Testament. That's where we start. You got to go past the book they stole and call their own and then give it no meaning calling it an Old Testament. Let's just delete it and take it out. It's got no business with the New Testament. And who is that line? Why do we start there? It's the line of Jesus Christ. The kings, the line, God no longer wanted. That's where it starts. God did not banish this line of Jesse of the kings of Judah until long after the death of Isaiah. God knew in Isaiah's time that the line of the kings of Judah would be taken into exile and his temple destroyed. That he would end that line, leaving just the stump of Jesse for his anointed one to be raised from. Jesse, <coughs> Jesus, could not fulfill the book of Isaiah, not for the reason that his line had been banished, but simply because he doesn't come from the stump. I mean, Christians can say, oh, well, that line was banished, but he sent Jesus anyway, so he must have lent, he must have lifted the banishment. Yeah, but he's still not from the stump. And he's certainly not describing Isaiah 53. You need to take your scissors and cut your Old Testament out. Your Old Testament doesn't belong with the New Testament. There is no Jesus in it. He didn't do anything in it except he took some parts that the Jews expected like a conqueror, a savior. Well, they're under, they're, they're all under rule of Rome. Jesus takes one prophecy and says, all the prophets say of me, using your Old Testament Christians, all the prophets say of me, I shall ride this ass into Jerusalem. And in the next, what the prophecy he's quoting, the next verse is verse 10. Zechariah chapter 9, verses 9 and 10. And he says, and there the Gentiles will scourge me, spit on me, spate me, uh, and kill me. But on the third day I shall rise. All the prophets, Jesus, well, let me see, I got 20 right here. Right, Christians, you've got 20. Open them up. Open him up and see if he's telling the truth. Now, back when Christianity got started, nobody could do that. That's why it got rolling in such a ridiculous concept. God made a human sacrifice to you, the Son, so you don't have to obey his laws. And he left the Jews because they sinned too much. Well, why, why did you have to have somebody uh, sacrifice for you to be free and righteous and free of your sins? You weren't sinless when God said, I can't take the Jews anymore? Oh, I think you weren't. Yeah, I don't think so. And guess what? No Jesus ever died for your sin. There's not a Gentile out there that's not responsible for his sins and will not be in righteousness and will not be in right standing. And there's no way you ever are going to go to the Jewish heaven. God says, I'm making a heaven where the name Israel shall endure if you want to see heaven, if you want to find forgiveness, if you want to fall under the written con <clears throat> written forgiveness God brings with him in the day of the Lord, which is today, according to Jeremiah 31, then you're going to have to convert to Judaism. You're going to have to become a Jew. And guess what? God would say back at you. You go to my people and try to force them to convert to Christianity, a pagan sect of human sacrifice back at you and you know why he says that because he tells his people in chapter 51 of isaiah which leads into the description 
other righteous servant in 52 and 53. I'm taking my <clears throat> cup of wrath, my bowl of reeling from you, and I'm passing it to those who told you to get down on the ground and walked all over you. There would be you Christians. You took the book. You told them they don't know how to read it. You told them they it's prophetic of Jesus Christ, a false idol, a false god. You told them that he's the man in Isaiah 53. And so this is what happens. That, that's chapter 11, talking about the uh, symbolism of an ancestral tree. For he has grown by his savior like a tree crown, like a tree trunk out of airy ground. That's Isaiah chapter 53, verse 2. This continues the symbolism of the ancestral tree. This man grows by the favor of God like a tree crown. A dominant tree crown reaches up over all other plants in the forest, including the crowns of other trees, from a sinful man whose life has been full of pain, suffering, <laughs> sorrows, and familiar with disease, that the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, alights upon, and God's presence is in him, to the crown of God's righteous servant, there are other verses of Isaiah 11 that connect the anointed one to the man described in Isaiah 53. The stock of Jesse that has remained standing shall become a standard to peoples. Nations shall seek his counsel and his abode shall be honored. That's Isaiah chapter 11 verse 10. By oppressive judgment, he was taken away. Who could describe his abode? For he was cut off from the land of the living through the sin of my people who deserved the punishment. That's Isaiah 53, 8. And his grave was set among the wicked and with the rich in his death. Though he had done no injustice and had spoken no falsehood. That's Isaiah 53, 9. Assuredly, I will give him the many as his portion. He shall receive the multitude as his spoil. That's Isaiah 53, 12. The abode of the righteous servant is humble when the Lord cuts him off from the land of the living. In Isaiah 53, the world of material things in society. That's in Isaiah 53, 8. And in the end, the abode of the servant is one to be honored, in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 10, from a poor man to a rich man, with the many as his portion and the multitude as his spoil and an abode to the honor. Those are just simple ways God had connected chapter 11. The met but the sages got it. God's not going to say he's sending a man and not describing for us. we got to know how to locate him. But as I said, those who say Israel's described the Jewish people, and how did the right, what have they done as the righteous servant? When does it happen? You know, Jews for Judaism would say, oh, when the Messianic here is when David gets here. Oh, really? Well, what are you going to be doing since when David comes, God has a reckoning with the rabbis and dismisses you? And just so you know, I am the man described in Isaiah 53. God is here. I am the descendant of David. And you, Rabbi, are dismissed in the eyes of God who has me tell you this, this very morning. Thank you for listening. God's presence, the angel of his presence, and Moshe, man and divine beings. Rabbi Solo. Jezaki, generally known today by the acronym Rashi, Rabbi Slomo Ishaki, was a medieval French rabbi, and that's what this article said in Wikipedia that I uh, googled and found, but uh, he actually was in the period of antiquity, which ends in 400 common era. He's often referred to as the first rabbi who believed that the Jewish people as one man, or God's righteous servant, 
The early sages expected a personal Messiah to fulfill the Isaiah prophecy. Chapter 53, chapter 11. Chapter 11, the descendant of David has the Spirit of God alight upon him. And if you read Ezekiel, the key to Isaiah 53, the Spirit enters him. No alternative interpretation was applied to this passage until this time. <clears throat> Rashi believed that the servant passages of Isaiah referred to the collective faith of the nation of Israel rather than a personal Messiah. Some rabbis, such as Ibn Ezra and Kinski, agree. However, many other rabbinic sages, <clears throat> including Moses ben Maimon, commonly known as Maimonides, or Maimonides, and also referred to by the acronym Rambam, a medieval Sephardic Jewish philosopher who became one of the most prolific and influential Torah scholars of the Middle Ages, realized the inconsistency of Rashi's views and would not abandon the original Messianic interpretations. I can add much to that. Rashi's commentary on Isaiah chapter 52, 13 to 15, which are the beginning of the description of God's righteous servant, leading into chapter 53. The Rashi's commentary conflicts with his commentary on the book of Zechariah, chapter 1, when he says, this is his leading to his commentary on Zechariah 1, the prophecy of Zechariah is extremely enigmatic because it contains visions resembling a dream that requires an interpretation. We cannot ascertain the truth of its interpretation until the teacher of righteousness comes. The teacher of righteousness, that is the man of Isaiah 53. He's God's righteous servant who makes the many righteous with long life and by his knowledge. The truth of the interpretation of the prophecy of Zechariah 1 begins with the creation of the angel of God's presence. God created all things, including spirit and souls, that together form persons. The first person he created was the person of his spirit, who is the angel of his presence, the Holy Spirit. This can be found in Isaiah 63. Isaiah 63, 9 through 10. In all their troubles, he was troubled. And the angel of his presence delivered them. In his love and pity, he himself redeemed them, raised them, and exalted them all the days of old. But they grieved his Holy Spirit. Then he became their enemy, and himself made war against them. So it starts out, the angel of his presence delivers them. And then would be, in all their troubles, the Jewish people. In his love and pity, capital H, God redeemed them, raised them, and exalted them all the days of old. It's the same thing. If you redeem them, you deliver them. The Holy Spirit is greed. Has to be a person. Judaism does not believe the Holy Spirit is a person. Okay. He can't be grieved if he's not. And there's plenty of other scripture to support the belief that indeed he is a person. He goes to Ezekiel at one point and says, Ezekiel, speak. He takes Ezekiel using a spirit on a vision. And I'm going to get to all that. The Spirit of God does. And that's the angel of His presence. And it makes sense. 
Because God created an angel, and I'm going to go into that. And for its body, not human form with wings. His body is the spirit of God. So he's an angel, and he's a spirit. The angel of his presence, which makes sense. Wherever God's presence is, which is his mind, it's where he feels he is, as we do. Where we go, our mind goes, and this is where we're at. And that is what goes into the temple of God, along with his spirit, his Holy Spirit, the angel of his presence, is the Shekinah. That, that Ezekiel sees in a vision enter the east gate for the, to, to, to enter the temple. All persons, all persons, the lightning, when God says, let us make God in our image, the spirit is hovering over the waters of the earth in creation. Okay, that's the person he's speaking to who does not respond. There's lots of reasons for that <clears throat> that I'm not going to go into right now because I'm going to get to Zechariah. The image is he is a being in existence. We're with emotions. He has no form. He has no human body. He's never had a human body. He was never born again in the flesh or born in the flesh, as they say of Jesus. He is an entity to be seen. All persons. Our souls blended with spirit. Our soul is like our DNA, okay, for the spirit. It's, it's, it's the foundation of the person we are, along with our upbringing, of course. <clears throat> Environmental and genetic. So, all the different references in the Hebrew Bible to spirit versus soul, pretty much talking about a person. And that's... That's how to think of God and the angel of his presence, the Holy Spirit, the persons. But that's about, you know, but you can't liken them to human persons. They simply aren't. They can communicate with man as though they were human persons. In other words, make the human person comfortable while we communicate with him to accomplish our purposes that we want in our creation. They come first in everything. This is, this is theirs, this world. Humanity, it's all theirs. God, God, God says, I am my creation. And you won't find that in the Hebrew Bible. That's straight from there. And you'll see why by the time this is over. God takes this special soul. And places it before his face. And speaks the words, I am. But God does not use his voice. He becomes the person he is creating. I mean, he's still God. He's, uh, uh, I don't know the right word for it right now. Emulating. He uses the childlike voice of an angelic person. He speaks to the angel as God and answers for him as the angel. The spirit, spirit is very complicated, is absorbing this as though, as though a mind in and of itself. And here's the interesting thing about spirit. You are not, your thoughts are not your brain. Your thoughts are from the spirit that God placed within you at birth. Your brain takes in, through your eyes and your ears, information that is really nothing more than little synopsis, electricity, chemicals, special tissue in different parts of the brain. Spirit can read it. It read it and it becomes your thoughts. If not, there could not be an afterlife. There could not be a spiritual heaven because you don't have your mind. 
God has to supply the information for you just as he's doing with the creation of the angel of his presence. He is the information of your mind which in the heaven that he is creating for the Jewish people with the name Israel shall endure is information primarily based on being a Jew, Judaism, a Hebrew Bible, town, Jewish history, Jewish culture, Jewish cooking, Jewish everything. That's the heaven he's making. He calls it Jerusalem. And he calls it something of the earth for antiquity and the Middle Ages. This book is written for them first and for us to reinterpret in the age of the common era, which includes the age of enlightenment, reason, knowledge, medicine, science, and today information, the internet, which began with computers in the late 1960s. God simulates being this new person for ages and ages until he is perfect as God would be, would have him be. Then God releases its soul and spirit from before his face with the breath of life. And the person of the spirit of the God was created. An angel whose body is the spirit of the holy God, the Holy Spirit. God is always in him. God was him. God can always place the person of the spirit before his face and be him and speak as him and through him. And this is how God is in the angel that was sent to guard the Israelites on the way to the promised land. I am sending my angel. <laughs> I have a computer problem. I am sending my angel before you to guard you on the way and bring you to the place that I have made ready. Pay heed to him and obey him. Do not defy him. For he will not pardon your senses, since my name, Hashem, my name, is in him. But if you obey him and do all that I say, I will be an enemy to your enemies and a foe to your foes. They're together. Imagine two clouds. Here's the elements of the unseen that are God's mind. Here, this cloud are the elements of the angel and the Holy Spirit of God. Two clouds, and they just come together. God remains one. He created this cloud. But they're together as one cloud. So when the Spirit of God enters a man, and I'm going to show this in Zechariah, it's the purpose that God had it written for me. And it's why she says we've got to wait on the teacher of righteousness for somebody to interpret this. Well, that's what this video is. The interpretation of Zechariah 1. But anyway, you have these two clouds. When the Spirit entered Ezekiel, he could hear God's voice. God's speaking to him, and he says at that moment, the Spirit entered into me, and I could hear the words of God. That's what that's all about. And there's a lot more, and I'll get to that. Well, Ezekiel says, And he said to me, O mortal, stand up on your feet, that I might speak to you. As he spoke to me, a spirit entered into me and set me upon my feet, and I heard what was being spoken to me. So this is God speaking to a man who is Ezekiel, but he does not hear God speaking until at the same moment a spirit enters into him and sets him upon his feet. The spirit of God entering man and God speaking means the angel of God's presence, who is spirit, alighted upon him as he does Moshe. And God is in him. From chapter 11, verses 1 and 2 of Isaiah. A light's upon, the Spirit of God, a light's upon the twig that sprouts from the shoot of the stump of Jesse. 
The tree is Moshe. The shoot is a descendant of King David through King Solomon, each of whom had Davidic uh, covenants with God for kingship and their line, excluding the kings of Judah that we have in the Hebrew Bible. That entire uh, ancestral tree cut down, and there's only a stump remaining. Jesse is the father of King David. Ezekiel says, The presence of the Lord ascended from the midst of the city, Jerusalem, and stood on the hill east of the city. A spirit carried me away and brought me in a vision by the Spirit of God. Okay, he's got to be a person. To the exiled community in Chaldea, then the vision that I had seen left me, and I told the exiles, Syrian Babylon exiles, from the northern kingdom and from the southern kingdom, all the things that the Lord had shown me, that the Lord had shown me. But it's the spirit of God that takes him on a vision. Again, standing on a hill or not, they're together. I don't know how that works. But God is showing his oneness in that. That's what that story is about. He's showing his oneness. <coughs> he's showing he's separate and apart from the Spirit. But that the Spirit is a person. He's the one that takes Ezekiel. Who has a guide with him. A spirit. That's why it's, with the Spirit, the Spirit of God takes Ezekiel on a vision. Because Zechariah, the same story. And that's why I'm giving you all this information. Same story there. He has a God, an angel God with him. And it's about the angel of the Lord. And the angel of the Lord is the angel of God's presence. The only power in heaven is God. Moses did not perform miracles in the Exodus. God did. The angel of death did not kill the firstborn of Egypt. God did. The power of God is his and his alone. He does not share it or create it in others. His power comes from his will. He thanks it. He speaks it. And it is. Just as with creation in Genesis. It is, it is a physical process. So he doesn't have a magic wand. Things happen in the unseen, elements we can't understand. Our science is so different. His realm was there. He created all of the universe with the big bang as it is now. He created it all. As he says, I divided light and I divided darkness. If you take the platform of heaven, and this is just this is just the best we could possibly understand it, the bottom part would be painted black, the top part a bright white light. That's heaven. The dark part, he had to put suns in and worlds. That's us. And you can find that in Genesis first page, chapter one. He did not say, let there be abundant water, and it simply was, going, keeping on with the same um, idea. He drew water from space. Space has small molecules of, of H2O. He drew from the universe. The waters for this planet. No other planet has this. What we these oceans and lakes and rivers. And, you know, Moses is named, and so he he was uh, Moses means drawn from water. Of course, that's because he was found in a basket, but in the Nile. I thought that was interesting. Okay, so God created humanity. Then He added a script, as though for a reality television show. The script of the story of the Jewish people. And the day of the Lord. And he prepared it with the scripture. This day was in his mind as the Torah was. Before he ever started creation. 
He put it all together in his mind and willed it to be. But there was a process. Man doesn't, he didn't actually take sand of the earth. That is a reference to the elements of the earth. We have over 62 elements of the earth in our bodies. But it's part of the construction. But that's a whole other video in and of itself. But I mean, but he, he created mankind. The, okay, so he prepared not only the Torah, but Ezekiel wrote Ezekiel. I mean, that's the best way to look at it. God may have had to use other people, may have had a spirit enter somebody else and say, I'm God, get a stylus, get some parchment, write this down. And you don't say no. But the best way I have been told to look at it is whoever the main character is, Ezekiel. If it's the prophets and they're writing words of God, then a spirit has a lit upon them. They are a man in divine beings. And that's all it is, man. Just we, we first see man in divine beings with Jacob when God speaks to him and changes, renames him Israel. And all he did was, there's, there's Jacob sleeping with his head on the sun, and God tells his spirit, his angel, I'm going to rename Jacob today and begin the creation, the form, the formation of my people, Israel, the Jewish people. He had already begun it with Abram when he named him a Hebrew out of nowhere. Abraham wasn't born a Hebrew. He just came up with it. Just like when in Persia, in the exile, is the first time we see Jew. Has nothing to do with Jew. It ends with E.W. What I'm told from God is that, is, is that it was the dilution of the pure Hebrew blood to intermarriage between the tribes and things during the exile and, and uh, with Gentiles. And he just changed it. And he said he knew it would be a name that would stick in the world. I <laughs> mean, you think of Jew, you think of the Jewish people. You think of Judaism. They go together. It's just, you know, it's like Hebrew. He just, that's the word I want to use. And Hebrew, in Hebrew, is Iver. That kills me. Abraham the Iver. I don't know. It just doesn't sound near as majestic. But uh, I don't speak Hebrew, by the way, nor do I read it. I've been working on it. And you, you can see this, that he had the prophets writing the, the books that they wrote. Because the day of the Lord and the time for it is set up through the books of Isaiah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, and Malachi. You have to put those four together. And it's so easy. When the land blooms again, which began in 1948, after desolation and everything ruined, the ruined cities, and then see a time is coming, Jerusalem has to be rebuilt from certain biblical markers, and it has been. See a time is coming, I'll make a new covenant with you. Well, that's today. That's how easy it is. All, all God has been saying is, when y'all come back, I'll come back. I won't come with a covenant of friendship. When David's here, because when he, because when David comes, well, when he's here, God has a reckoning with the shepherds. That's the rabbis. And he dismisses all of them. They're dismissed. And there's lots of reasons for that. I've already dealt with it on other videos. But you never hear it practiced or preached. I mean, not practiced. You, 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 I've never seen a rabbi talk about it. They always say, Moshe come, Moshe come. They prayed for Moshe, the anointed one, because they believe in a Messianic area that's based on verses for antiquity that were never meant to be thought of as actually occurring except by those people because they lived in a different world, completely different world. If a prophecy cannot occur in reality, there's another purpose for it. That is one purpose for religious purposes. And in part, that's why the Spirit of God doesn't answer God in Genesis when he says he's going to create man in his image. It just causes conflict because everybody comes up with something else. 
and things like that. And, and, and just for religious purposes, for antiquity, the people of antiquity, and, um, and for prophecy. Prophecy is there, but if a prophecy cannot be, now I'm not talking about miracles that God did in the Exodus. He specifically, specifically did those things. Although they've been blown out of proportion in Ten Commandments, but he's like, it doesn't say he parted the water. It says an east wind blew the waters back all night long. And God made the, the, the land dry. And then they crossed up. <coughs> and I guess he let it go when Pharaoh's armies got there. I don't really study the Torah very much. Basically, the prophets in the day of the Lord. I was an atheist for 50 years. I didn't read the Bible for the first time until I was 50. And that's because God said, let's go to the bookstore and get you a Tanakh. And I said, well, what's a Tanakh? <laughs> that's, where I, that's how far back I started. And yet I know all these things. How do I know all these things? God's dictating them to me as he dictated the Torah to Moses. I'm the Moshe, I'm the man described in Isaiah 53, the righteous servant, and I'm the prophet like Moses. And Elijah, whose purpose is the same as the purpose of the righteous servant to make the many righteous. And I'll, I'll, I'll get to that. He said, we counsel the sons to the father and the fathers to the son, and that commandment, that task, Immediately follows the verse, verse 22, be mindful, be mindful of the teachings I gave Moses at Oreb of my laws and rules and commandments for all of Israel. That's the amendment. The new covenant is not new. The first covenant is still there because it keeps repeating, I will be your God, you will be my people. Okay, that's all the backdrop I need. Uh, I've already gone through a half an hour. That's all my camera will record at a time. I had to take a short break. <clears throat> but the new covenant is, it's, that's what it is. That's the amendment. Be mindful. That, what is mindful? Well, <clears throat> it's not strict compliance. Okay, but it's still the teachings that Moses gave to the Israelites that, we, that, that he had to write down first. I mean, that's how you know. I mean, God says, Moses, go tell the Israelites this. And you have a chapter in Leviticus. Okay. But we have it. He didn't just simply go tell. No, it started with Moses, get a parchment and stylus, write this down. Now, go tell them. Which makes sense. How are you going to remember all that? I couldn't get out of the tent. And uh, I would poke my head back in and say, what's the first sentence? <laughs> And drawn the ire of God, which you never want to do. You really don't. Zechariah, I'm, I'm going to go to uh, chapter one, just verses seven through twelve. And this is this is in my book that God dictated Isaiah fifty three in the day of the Lord, uh, unpublished. For some reason, Jewish publishers. <laughs> I think it's a little too much and too different from the Judaism they know. Well, the Judaism they know is stuck in antiquity. And that's the problem. There's no day of the Lord in the Messianic era. There's no vindication against the Christians. And yet he, tell, he says in chapter 51 of Isaiah, I'm passing the cup of my wrath from you to those who told you to get down and walk all over your back. Adam never saw. He's coming from Adam, a Christian country. That's why it's arid land in verse 2, or possibly 3, of chapter 53. Which you'll see when, in some of my other videos. I, I have a video, yeah. Okay, anyway. Verse 7. On the 24th day of the 11th month of the second year of Darius, the month of Shabbat, the word, this word of the Lord came to the prophet Zechariah, son of Berechiah, son of Edo. Verse 8. In the night, in the night, I had a vision. 
I saw a man mounted on a bay horse standing among the myrtles in the deep. And behind him were bay, sorrel, and white horses. Now it says, it says, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Zechariah. The word of the Lord is his angel, it's the messenger of his words, the angel of his presence, the Holy Spirit. That's the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord said to me, but the words that come again, God is in him. God's presence. I didn't finish this. His mind. Okay. That's his presence. Well, where's the angel? It's the angel of his presence. It's right there. Okay. Holy Spirit. Where's God's spirit? It's all around me. Our spirit fills us. So it's the same thing. Holy Spirit, angel of his presence. And the spirit is the body of that particular angel. Who is the angel of the Lord? That enters people and God is in him. Uh, and, and that's what this chapter is about. It's the answer. It's, 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 it's a story. As much as anything. It's based on something that happened on the ground. I'll, I'll get into that. But it's not a vision. And it's not, it's, it's not likened to a dream. There's purposes behind this. And prophecy is not all of it by any stretch of the imagination. It's for this teaching in the day of the Lord. So there's a man standing in the myrtles. On a horse. He's on a horse and the horse is standing in the myrtles. Zechariah has an angel with him who is his guide in this vision. I mentioned Ezekiel and the, the spirit uh, when he was taken to, to Chalvi in a vision. The deep is like a valley. Zechariah is looking down on filled with myrtle trees. And then an open area below that where there are basal and white horses. Verse 9, I ask, what are those, my Lord? And the angel who talked with me answered, I will let you know what they are. Zechariah is not talking to the angel that is with him, who is clearly not a Lord. The small case Lord, by the way that is with him, who answered, but he never lets him know. He, he just said, I'll tell you basically later, and he, he never does. He is talking to the man standing among the myrtles on a bay horse about the horses in the open area. Again, it's a story with purposes behind it. There's no reason to believe Zechariah didn't go and see a man on a horse and converse with him. And then God was <laughs> all this story around it because he's got a purpose in it. God has a purpose. Yeah. He's going to get it done. A purpose with might prosper in Isaiah 53. First time I read that, I said, how you as God could have a purpose and it only might prosper? And he says, you'll see, it connects you with Elijah. Because if Elijah doesn't accomplish his purpose of clearing the way for the Lord, which is building of the temple, it's Elijah, it's not David. And if he doesn't do it, God says, when I come, I'm coming with utter destruction. As I said, God says, I am my creation. He's not talking about doing it in his power, such as Sodom and Gomorrah. He's saying, he may as well have said, I'm going to raise up armies against you. It'd be the same thing if you don't get his temple built. For him to return to suddenly, that's his purpose, and it might prosper. And if it doesn't, if people don't recognize Elijah, which means recognize me through the description of Isaiah 53, then the discussion comes to the land. There's 7 million Israeli Jews right now. That should ring a bell. That chimes never forget. He's saying, if this doesn't happen, this, this building of the temple, this announcing, that the true Mushiach is here, Mashiach. That the Christians are wrong, that there is no Allah, which is nothing but a plagiarism of the Hebrew Bible. They call themselves the light. They say Abraham is their father. They bring it from Adam and Eve. And they put their own cultural laws, ways, means, mores, philosophies 
into it in place of God's word as we know it, which is God's word in the Hebrew Bible. So he's talking to the man. Then the man who was standing among the myrtles spoke up and said, these were sent out by the Lord to roam the earth. It's the man in the myrtles that answers the question of Zechariah, not the angel who is with him. Verse 11, and in fact, they reported to the angel of the Lord who was standing among the myrtles. We have roamed the earth and have found all the earth dwelling in tranquility. So what did these horses do in this story? They reported to the angel of the Lord. Which is the man on the horse in the myrtles. How is the man on a horse the angel of the Lord? The Spirit of God has entered him and God is in his spirit. He is a man in divine beings. To the angelic horses, <laughs> the horses who can talk in the story, they can see the angel of the Lord, but we can't. He made a spirit. We can't see spirit. Our science, see, we're in a universe within a universe. God's universe is there, and he added all this. this that's, that's when creation really got gone for God. And he loves it. Uh, and there's reasons for that. Uh, from the entity that he is, the being that he is, there's a reason he likes to be down here. It's kind of hard to fathom, but uh, that's for in the future. We'll get, get into that more. I need to learn more about it. God is using this man as his visible presence, his rep representation through the angel of his presence, which is what he did with Moses. This is what he's going to do with Moshe, which he is doing with Moshe. Which he did with the prophets. Write this down. The man and divine beings. They, they, he can actually, he can literally speak to you. He can speak to me. He did it to me. I was in the bathroom looking in the mirror. I was going to shave. And, 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 and my head tilts up. His power surrounds me like the cords of power that, that surrounded Ezekiel and pinned him to the ground for almost a year and a half for the punishment of the sins of the house of Israel. Again, Ezekiel is the key to 53. He goes through God's fire refinement of, and you'll find all these words in chapter 53, punishment, wounding, chastisement, maltreatment, crushing, and bruising. Crushing and bruising, being pinned to the ground, do that to you. Maltreatment, just being pinned to the ground is maltreatment. But the whole time he was teaching Ezekiel, eat this scroll of Ezekiel, how, how to preach to the exile. How to tell them God's words. He's learning as he's going through. And why? Because Ezekiel said, a spirit entered into me, and I went in bitterness and in the fury of my spirit in the hand of God. That's the fire of refinement. He's not happy at all. And, and it's brutal. It's brutal. Yeah, I mean, you, you wouldn't say no. It, nobody would say no to God. He didn't have to crush me with cancer to have me offer myself for the guilt and emotion of the Jewish people for unrighteousness. You know, chapter, uh, chapter 53 starts with six verses of the witnesses who are all saying, we're sick, we're sick, and we're suffering. Well, they're sick because, because they feel guilty. They, they're not doing right. And they know if they had followed God's laws, their family would be better, they would be better, their neighbors would be better, they'd be a light to other people, they'd feel good about themselves and said they're sick. That's why he's the righteous servant. I see, I, I see these rabbis preaching, it's the kings from chapter 52 who were startled and silenced. Why? When did they get maltreated, crushed, bruised, wounded, punished? I, I don't know. And it's in quotes. The first six verses are in quotes. And the only book that has that is the Jewish Publication Society that began as a complete new transcription from the Leningrad Codex, the oldest Hebrew Bible we have. Completely new. It has the quotes. 
Shabbat.org and all their comments and commentary with Rashi don't have it. And it's important. It makes you know that the first three people talking who have heard our report, since they don't use any of those big suffering words because of the quotes, they're included as witnesses that are made righteous. That's what it's all about. And all those words are just for what the man has to go through to become the man of righteousness. So he bears all that suffering, and by it, he's not crucified. He makes them righteous. They're not sick anymore. It's, there's no vicarious suffering or anything. It has nothing to do with that. And God tells you in Ezekiel, he tells Ezekiel, you're going to suffer the punishment of the house of Israel and Judah. Really, it's just the punishment corresponding to. But to Ezekiel, what he just did was make him angry again. He's going to make him angry so many times that Ezekiel finally, like Moses, becomes humble. Moses began with a fiery spirit, so angry he killed the man. At the end of his 40 years with God, he is said to be the most humble man on earth. <laughs> That's because of God's fire of famine. It's not mentioned in the Torah because it was left for me to tell you about it, rabbis. And if you don't want to be dismissed, which means not in right standing, which means you fall into the category of, even though it's not so, but you're in that category, those who do not heed him, do not fear him, do not revere and esteem his name. In other words, he don't pay attention to you. That's all it means. It's not coming after you. <laughs> We're not that important to me. <clears throat> So, this, verse 12, finally, right? Thereupon the angel of the Lord exclaimed, O Lord of hosts, how long will you withhold pardon from Jerusalem and the towns of Judah, which you placed under a curse 70 years ago? That's what the interpretation of Rashi is referring to is needed. He didn't even realize he had all this information on the angel of the Lord. And it, and it's been taught to me. And, and again, you find it in Isaiah 63, one time. He says, angel is risen. One time. He says, Holy Spirit. He could have done it in the Torah. When he said, I send my angel before you, he could have said it right there. The angel of my presence, the Holy Spirit. But he did. He didn't want you to pick up on it. Rabbis, Judaism, sages of long ago. It's my proof. Not only do I have a description, and he dictated as a ghostwriter my life, the life of the righteous servant of God, of Isaiah 53. I have two books, they're both unpublished. But if you want to see how I truly fit these verses, read that book. The first seven chapters, I think, are uh, just life history that focuses in on basically injuries and cancer. And um, showing a man of suffering familiar with disease. And then uh, midway, the chapter, God speaks to an atheist. And from there, I, I relate everything that's been going on for 13 years. He's had me for 13, had Moses for 40. I'm still not the most humble, but he says he needs a little fire in me still. We got a lot to do. And just, he said, Moses did too. I didn't finish up with him till, yeah, till he was gone. There's always more improvement to be made, which just thrills me to know him, of course. So anyway, he's so funny. <laughs> Thereupon, this exclamation, uh, the man on the horse, also referred to as the angel of the Lord who is in him, said these words. God's presence is in the angel of the Lord. So what's it about? Well, you have to go in to the following verses from the book of Isaiah regarding the curse. Isaiah 43 and 2. So, this is God. So I profane the holy princesses. I abandon Jacob to proscription and Israel to mockery. Okay, that's the banish, that's the exile. 
of the Assyrian, the North Kingdom and the South Kingdom. This Assyrian Babylonian became Persia. They're not just the Babylonian exiles. All 13 tribes came back, remnants of each tribe. And that's, that, that is verified in Ezra and Nehemiah. And, and the profaning of the holy princesses, that's the banishment of Jekina, Jekina, and the uh, which gives us the son of Jesse. That's the, his banishment because of losing the second temple and the, the defeat by Babylon and the, the three deportations and until they were all finally gone. And in Assyria, Assyria had had defeated the northern kingdom, deported it to Assyria, and. Uh, imported Gentiles. That's why when the exiles return, they all go to Judah. It's not because there's no uh, tribes of the northern kingdom, which would be the major uh, all but two. Uh, Benj the lands of Benjamin are considered Judah because that's where the kings rule from. That's where Jerusalem is in the lands of Benjamin. And Judah is everything beneath it to Egypt. And then God has this, fear not, for I am with you. I will bring your folk from the east, will gather you from out of the west. I will say to the north, give back, and to the south, do not withhold. Bring my sons from afar, and my daughters from the end of the earth, all who are linked to my name, who I have created, formed, and made for my glory. This is God's prophecy that all the tribes of Israel will return from the uh, Assyrian deportations of the tribes east of the river Jordan that were Reuben, Gad, and the half tribe of Manasseh, and all the tribes of the northern kingdom, and the Babylonian deportations of the southern kingdom. It is a prophecy that is specific to the Assyrian Babylonian exiles. And it's fulfilled according to Ezra. Ezra chapter 3, verse 1. When the seventh month arrived, the Israelites being settled in their towns, which would be in Judah, they would have had to establish them, these, these northern kingdom tribes, the entire people assembled as one man in Jerusalem. Okay, Benjamin and Judah are not the entire people of Israel. They simply aren't. You have to have all of the tribes. That's followed by this. And, and really there's a lot more in Nehemiah and Ezra. All of Israel had returned together to Jerusalem, mindful of the imported Gentiles. 1 Chronicles, chapter 9, verses 2 and 3. The first who settled in their towns on their property were Israelites, priests, Levites, and temple servants, while some of the Judeites, and some of the Benjamites, and some of the Ephraimites, and some of the Manassehites settled in Jerusalem. Now what do we just list? The largest landowners, the priestly tribe, of course, and little Benjamin, because Jerusalem's there. Judah, Ephraim, Manasseh, largest tribes, largest lot owners. That's why they're mentioned by name. Didn't mention all twelve of them, all thirteen. And even so, you have to say, well, there weren't ten lost out of eight, or whatever the number would be. <clears throat> it's just a story I believe that originates in the town. Nobody got lost. Nobody got lost. The Mediterranean's right there. Everybody can find an ocean, a sea. Just follow. You, you'll find where you came from. And so God's prophecy fulfilled. They came back. You know, it was just a remnant of them. And many of them stayed. Uh, historically, we know, or it's said, that many many of the uh, the exiles stayed in Syria, Babylon, well, Persia. Until it was no longer Persia. <clears throat> and also, for, again, this chapter 43, 25. It is I, I, who, for my own sake, wipe out your transactions and remember your sins no more. This is God doing something new for the Israelites. Guess what he's doing again? It's not a messianic era. It's the day of the Lord. What's he doing? He's sending a new covenant. Who with? The angel of his covenant. Who's the messenger? Elijah. What does the messenger do? He takes the covenant and delivers it to the world, to the Jewish people. 
Why Elijah? The only man specifically taken to heaven in the Hebrew Bible and God sends him back? You have to ask yourself, what's that about? Well, other than the fact that God will have taught him everything you can know if you had been taken to heaven, and all the information of heaven, which you've been hearing from me in this video and in prior videos, <clears throat> and this, who's going to be able to talk to the angel? Well, how about the man who's been in heaven for thousands of years? Elijah. And he takes that covenant, it's a new covenant, and there's the sin forgiveness. I will forgive your sins and remember them no more, and this will write tore on your heart and all will heal. That is clarified in Malachi 3. And uh, you have the amendment. That's in addition to the first covenant. This sin forgiveness. That's what it is, because God says, you, you'll have tore on your heart because I'm going to forgive your sins. Well, that doesn't seem to go together. How does that? Because, and Elijah's purpose is, Bring them back to Judaism. We counsel the families, one member to the other. How are you going to do that? Well, here's an amendment to remind you. My, be mindful of my teachings to Moses. Judaism, bring them back. Make them righteous. Again, same purpose as the righteous servant. If it describes anybody and you want to stay in antiquity, it's not Jesus. It's Elijah. <laughs> and says, well, well, Elijah, we don't know if he comes before or after Moshe. So it, it is better that we study Torah and not worry ourselves about things we, we, we cannot understand from, from the prophets. It's easy to understand. If you're the man experiencing it, I'll give him a break. He's right. We'll have to wait till he gets here. Just like this. Now, what's it all about? I want, uh, the the tape's getting short. I have... What can I do here? Okay, this vision of Zechariah and the words of the angel of the Lord to the man standing in the myrtles regarding the curse 70 years ago is made to Zechariah, is made to make Zechariah think and try to understand why is the angel saying this? From his perspective, the curse was lifted as he was back in Jerusalem with all the tribes preparing to build the second temple. The vision is for Zechariah to find out how and when the curse was lifted. Now, how's God going to avoid that problem again? The description of a man in the day of the Lord. They're going to hear it. They're going to hear it with these idiots that God is having me do. He, he wrote this. This is right. Well, it comes from a story that we had, but he had me put three chapters together and delete a bunch, slim it down, and get your camera, get some, get some eggs first. And tell, I, I had no self-will. He directs everything I do from within me, although his presence is without me too. I am the man, the Spirit of God, entered into, lived upon, entered into, and God is in him. And that's how I know all these teachings. That's how I can write the books, because I'm like, okay, we, I know you taught me all that, but what's the first sentence? So give me a few words, and I'll see if I can type the rest. And he said, you just type what I tell you to write. <laughs> okay. He, he really, he's got such a far-ranging personality. I mean, he's not just the God of the Torah who is punishing and plaguing and angry. You know, Moses hits a rock instead of speaking to it to give water. And God says, well, that's it, Moses. That's it. Forty years after what he invented. That's it, Moses. You're not going into the promised land. Go to the mountain and die. That's a little over the top. I mean, he's tough, but he likes to be perceived as tough. He says you needed it back then. You had to sound like, you know, you drop it. <laughs> and, and that's why I will raise up armies against you. And he's looking over and he sees Rome. He sees Greece and he sees Persia. He's going, they're coming. They'll come again. Once they find out that they have a, a one God <laughs> and scrolls that God supposedly... Uh, dictated the Torah, and, and it, it's a beautiful land if you know how to take care of it. I mean, it laid in desolation. You, you should see the pictures of when uh, Mark Twain went there in the early uh, late 1800s. He wrote down, "It's just desolate," <laughs> you know. And now, 
you know, just Google it and go, go look at everything Israel. It is one of the most beautiful countries in the world. Always rank in everything, living conditions, the people, happiness, everything you can rate a country on, they're always in the top ten. And they had the finest, the finest Air Force in all the Middle East. And their army is it ranks second to nobody, but if you combine the armies of all the nations of the Middle East, Iran, Iraq, you know, then you got a problem. If they all launch at the same time, you're going to have a destroyed Israel. And there's no reason to believe they won't if they can't do it. God says, you're going to get destroyed. You don't recognize my prophet. Once again, I'm dismissing you, but you can come out of it and help me by straightening out this messianic era with your followers. Learn these books. And these are new teachings. Preach them. Teach them. Tell them how God does and Tell them he's doing it again. Tell them what Isaiah 53 is really about. It's not the people of Israel. How are they going to be God's representative in the day of the Lord? A song. You know who came up with that being a song of Israel? A Christian. A Christian commentator on the Old Testament. A testament that Jesus died saying, hating. It says, and Jesus died hating the laws of Moses. God is in his spirit. Ezekiel says, and he said to me, O mortal, stand up on your feet that I may speak to you. As he spoke to me, a spirit entered into me and set me upon my feet. And I heard what was being said, spoken to me. This is God speaking to a man, who is Ezekiel, but he does not hear God speaking until at the same moment a spirit enters him and sets him upon his feet. A spirit of God entering man and God speaking means the angel of God's presence, <clears throat> who is the Holy Spirit, alighted upon him and entered him, and God is in him. Just as the Spirit of God alights upon and enters Moshiach of Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 and 2. Anytime an angel or spirit is present in a story and God speaks or his power is revealed, the angel or spirit is the angel of his presence, the Holy Spirit. The reason he's an angel and spirit is wherever God's presence is, the angel of his presence is there also. Wherever God's presence is, his Holy Spirit is there too. And they both appear in <clears throat> Isaiah chapter 63. One verse after another. And it's made clear because the Holy Spirit is said to be grieved if the Israelites do not obey God. You have to be a person to be grieved. And there's lots of other references to it. <clears throat> the person of God's Spirit is his constant companion that he created. And the reason any man he comes to is a man in divine beings, a host of the Lord's host. This is who Jacob said he wrestled with, and Elohim spoke and renamed him Israel, a man in divine beings. Well, God's always, they're, they're together. Angel of his presence, God's presence. If he comes to you, he's going to have his spirit enter you, and he is in his spirit. Moses tells the Israelites that God is here in order to test you and in order that the fear of him may be ever with you. God had Moses set a rule before the Israelites regarding the angel he sent to guard them on the way and to bring them to the place that he had made ready. Pay heed to him. Do not defy him. For he will not pardon your offenses, 
since my name, Hashem, is in him. But if you obey him and do all that I say, I will be an enemy to your enemies and a foe to your foes. That's Exodus chapter 23, verses 20 through 22. God had Moses set a rule before the Israelites regarding the angel. There are no orders, instructions, rules, or commandments between an angel and Moses or an angel and the Israelites. They all come from Moses, who receives them from God. This angel is the Holy Spirit, and that spirit has alighted upon and entered into Moses. And he can hear God speak, just like Ezekiel. Moses is a man in divine things. It just means God has come to you. He's in his spirit. His spirit enters you. God enters you. And you are suddenly a man in divine things being given tasks that God wants to perform. A man with divine beings is a host of the Lord's host, the descendant of King David that the Spirit of God alights upon is a host of the Lord's host, one God, one angel, the Holy Spirit, and one man. The account of a man who identified himself to Joshua as a Gentile and captain of the Lord's host in the book of Joshua is the first and only time the scripture describes a host of the Lord's host. The captain of the Lord's host is a host. This is from the book of Joshua. Once, when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw.